Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. This is really uh, a very, a very good audience for me to talk to because it's very, it's a very challenging audience for me. I'm mostly a theoretical researcher at heart, and it's very intimidating to 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 talk to such uh, such such hardcore uh, designers and uh, and programmers. And uh, the the talk before was very. Uh, it was very descriptive, and as, as a way of contrast, my talk is going to be on the prescriptive side. Uh, I'm not talking about how things are now, but about how I wish things are going to be in the future. So there is, there is a tension. Uh, there, is, there is a creative tension in programming languages. There's, there are two aspects of programming languages that sometimes conflict with each other. One is computation the desire to make your programs faster, to run faster, to use less memory, to use uh, fewer resources construed in any kind of way you might wish. And these are quantitative concerns. And these kind of very important quantitative concerns drive the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of research that we have just seen. And that's why it's in black there, because it, it, it ends up making things messy and complicated because it's really, really important to make them fast and efficient. On the other hand, in programming languages, we have structure. We don't only want to run computations, but we want to have a good way of piecing together complicated programs and complicated uh, pieces of software from their components. And this at sometimes comes at odds with efficiency. So in the world of programming languages, at one extreme you have things like C, at the other extreme uh, you have things like Haskell, OCaml, uh, Python. So these are the things in white, where the emphasis is more on structure and on ease of programming. And uh, this is the kind of space in which this talk is going to be. Concern with computation is very old. The idea of algorithm, the idea of algebra as well, were introduced in the 8th century by a Persian scholar called Al-Khwarizmi, who gave his name to the idea of algorithm. So this idea of mechanical computation is very old, and it, it has been around a long time, much, much longer than computers have been around. On the other hand, functions have not been uh, around quite so long. So that's what I'm going to, to talk about first. The role of functions in programming. To set the scene and the motivation a little bit. Uh, functions in programming, were in, they also go back a long way, but not quite as long as, as algorithmics and computation. And it's also not, uh, uh, not often the case where the first word on something, it's almost the final word on something. In, in the case of Alonzo Church, who invented the, uh, introduced the lambda calculus in 1936 uh, as a way of mechanizing mathematics and providing a constructive foundation for mathematics, he really hit the nail on the head with that one because lambda calculus is still now the ultimate vehicle for structuring programs. And uh, it... Uh, it, it plays a very important role in, in uh, theoretical computer sciences and in the study of programming languages. And we know that functions are very important. We know that we use functions to do uh, decomposition of programs, complicated programs, decomposing them in simpler programs. We need that we use the functions to avoid duplication of, co of code, uh, to uh, assist code reuse, to hide implementation details. And we know all these uh, methodological justifications for having functions around. And these are very good justification. And I'm not going to repeat them because I'm sure with this kind of uh, methodology and ideology you all uh, have been exposed to. But what I want to emphasize more 
is the practical role of functions in compilers. Because functions were introduced in the very first programming language, the very first proper programming language. Uh, here you have John Bacchus and an IBM 704, which was the machine on which the first Fortran programming, uh, uh, Fortran compiler operated. Uh, it was introduced in 1958. And this first proper programming language had support for functions. So it was really an intuition from the very beginning that functions are important. And what was really interesting is that functions were used in Fortran in a very practical way. They were used to give access to libraries. So this idea of separate compilation and libraries and access to libraries via functions was there from the very early uh, first uh, compilers. Um, the idea of function in a programming language came into its own much more in a bit later with the invention of the programming language Lisp by John McCarthy, who I'm sure you, 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 you are all know this programming language to some extent. Uh, and it is a programming language in which functions really came into their own. The idea of higher order uh, functions was supported. So functions in some sense were allowed to be used as data. So you could give functions as arguments to other functions and you could return functions as results from functions. But there was also another innovation in the use of functions in Lisp, and that was the idea of foreign function interface. Uh, and in Lisp, you can write a function that calls code that's actually not written in Lisp, but in a different programming language. And it is an enhancement on the kind of, uh, on the kind of separate compilation idea of, of that was already present in Fortran, that not only you can compile code separately, but you can have a syntax independent way of one program written in a, in a programming language to call another program written in a different programming language. And this is a very powerful idea because it allows more flexible, heterogeneous development and programming environment. Um, eventually, the, the hardware caught up with the software. So, in 1964, you, you found uh, support for function calls directly in the instruction set of processors. Before that, you, you had to sort of do it by hand, manipulating the flow of control by hand. And probably, the, the, as far as I'm concerned, the last important step was 19, uh, in, in the late 70s when Kernighan and Ritchie invented the C programming language and the Unix operating system. And in some sense, uh, it was a small step backwards because in C you don't have lambda, so you, don't, you cannot define arbitrary anonymous functions. You don't have currying, you don't have closures, you don't have partial application. There's some operations that you don't have. But you have functions. And actually, in some sense, you have high order functions as well. Because through functions to pointers, you can pass functions to functions as argument. But another practical innovation uh, that, that Kernighan and Ricci had was that they married the programming language and the operating system very closely to each other. And they built up the function interface, they call it the application binary interface, into the operating system. And they standardized it and they, they made it very clear so that through function calls you could not only access code, but you could access runtime services. You could interface in, uh, really with anything, with any other device running on, 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 your, uh, on your hardware that obeyed the specification of the application binary interface. So they extended uh, this idea of function as, as a way of gluing together uh, pieces of, uh, of computation, not only from code to code, but from code to anything that can be hardware for <coughs> Uh, what is quite interesting is that most of these people, as far as, I, uh, as far as I understand, they didn't have a clear connection between the function mechanism that they were using and uh, the fact that they were using a mechanism which was really the lambda calculus. Uh, the first connection, this connection was established in a clear way only in 1965 by Peter Landin, who said, 
listen guys, all this function stuff that you're using in various programming languages, it is really just the lambda calculus, uh, believe it or not. So that, this kind of concludes my brief survey of, uh, of, uh, of functions. And because the point that I wanted to make is whether you have kind of the, the metaphysical leaning of, of, of a Platonist and you think functions are very important for foundational and for this kind of more metaphysical reason, or you have, uh, you have the, the practical mind of an Aristotelian uh, and you know that functions can be used not only for, uh, f for the niceties that they offer methodologically, but also for gluing code together through separate compilation, heterogeneous compilation, runtime services, and so on. Uh, functions are essential. Functions are very important, both from a theoretical and practical point of view. Having established that, and nobody's objecting, um, I'm going to move on and say how are now in higher level synthesis, when we want to compile uh, code directly into hardware, uh, how are functions to be represented? <coughs> Somehow in, in, uh, in software, this idea occurred naturally. Nobody really was, seemed to have been very concerned about it. The people just did it and it worked out. In hardware is a bit, is a bit, more, uh, is a bit more, more complicated. And uh, this, is because, this is because hardware looks like that. Uh, when, 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 you, when you want to look at hardware, essentially you have a diagram. And diagrams have a structure that somehow doesn't suggest functions on the face of it. When you look at it, it's like, where are the functions? It's hard to see it. It looks more like a relational graph of things. So the first step that we're going to take is to look a little bit at the mathematical structures uh, that occur in diagrams. And uh, I'm going to bring up here algebra, as, as Tony did uh, uh, earlier, yesterday. And even, even worse, I'm going to mention category theory, which uh, I, maybe some people are gonna, uh, are gonna run away from the room. But I'm going to do it in a very user-friendly way. Because as it turns out, diagrams and categories go hand in hand very, very nicely. So let's look at a more serious diagram. This is, it doesn't matter what this circuit does, it's just a circuit. It's actually a decision weight, uh, it, it's a decision weight uh, circuit in a, in a, implemented asynchronously. But the important thing is that is a circuit. So we have four gates and we have some wires. And in a generic hardware description language, you might represent it somehow like that. So you instantiate your circuits, you declare some wires, and then you say what is connected to what. And this is, in a sense, a very low level because you have to keep track of a lot of irrelevant detail. And the irrelevant detail here, and in general in programming, manifests itself as names. There are a lot of names that you have to introduce and manage here. There's names of instances, there's names of ports, names of wires, there's lots of names. And that it tells you that is, you are in a very low level setting. Uh, moreover, this way of describing diagrams is very flat and unstructured and it obscures the mathematical structures that you actually find in circuits. So I'm going to present you a different way of specifying diagrams. And this is a way that is not actually new. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of presenting diagrams which is based on combinators. So first, let's uh, talk a little bit about interfaces. And by interfaces, I really mean interfaces to circuits, uh, where you think of inst interfaces at places, as places on a box where you can plug things in. So an interface is just going to be a list of names. And for notions that have to do with mathematical notation, I'm going to separate by this tensor symbol the names in an interface. And we have one operation on uh, interfaces, which is changing the polarity. So input changes to output, output changes to input. And this is obviously an involutive transformation. If you apply it twice, you get the same thing back. 
So here you have, for example, uh, how a composite uh, video interface would look like. And you have, if you apply the star operation, then you get that, right? So these are all inputs, uh, and those are all uh, sort of the, the converse uh, connective so that you can plug them in. Circuits, we're going to look at them as boxes with some of the interface put on the left uh, and some of the interface put on the right. And that is purely conventional. It doesn't matter that, uh, it doesn't mean that the stuff on the left is input, it doesn't mean that the stuff on the right is output. As a generalization of the input on the left, output on the right convention, everything that's on the left has the polarity reversed. So our circuit, we're going to say that this circuit F has shape A arrow B, where A arrow B is defined just as A with a star applied, and then B. So everything that's on the left has the reverse polarity. And then what you can do with circuits, it's obviously, is composition. And there are two ways you can compose these circuits. One of them is serial. So if I have two circuits that uh, have a matching interface B, I can plug them in seriously, serially, or parallel composition. I can put them uh, in parallel with each other. And you get uh, another circuit which is, has its own signature defined by the, uh, by the signature of its components. One special circuit that is going to come out uh, and plays a very important role is the identity. So that's the circuit that doesn't do anything. It is basically just a connector. Um, and because it is, a, it is an extension lead style connector, again, the, you can see why the input on the, sorry, the ports on the left and the ports on the right has to have, uh, they have to have reverse polarities so that they plug in. The plug-in operation is well defined. And uh, the parallel and the serial composition they have to play nicely with each other. And uh, the name that uh, uh, Tony Hoare gave to this, uh, to this fact, he called it the exchange law. Uh, another name that it has in category theory is functoriality. So this diagram that consists of four boxes, you can specify it in two ways. You can either put F and G in parallel, F prime in, and G prime in parallel, and then compose sequentially, or you can put F and F prime sequentially, G and G prime sequentially, and compose in parallel. In both cases, you get that diagram on the top, so these things should be equal. Another special case of diagrams, another special case of circuits, are isomorphisms. You can have two interfaces that have kind of, they're kind of very similar, but not quite equal. So uh, if you, uh, a good example of isomorphisms are adapters. So here uh, you have uh, DVI, to, uh, DVI to VGA adapters, for example. Yeah? So if you have, li like this one that I just used here. Yeah? So if you, have, if you have two interfaces like this, they're quite similar. You can, you can connect them with a, with, a, with a circuit like this, which inside it only has wires. And the defining property is that there, if you have an isomorphism, there should always be a reverse isomorphism. So if I plug them together like this, or if I plug them together like that, I should get something that behaves just like an extension lead. So if I go from uh, DVI to VGA and then back to DVI, I should really have the behavior of an extension lead for a DVI. Another property that we want to have is what basically amounts to a commutativity in, of the ports that we list in the interfaces. And that is called uh, braiding. So it doesn't matter if I say A followed by B or B followed by A, it, it means the same thing. And the way you express algebraically that it means the same thing is that if you take A and B and you swap them, and then you swap them again, what you get back is an identity. Now this, and that's called symmetry. So if you braid things twice, you get the symmetry. Now, in some areas of mathematics where you want to use the combinatory style to describe, for example, not theory, this obviously doesn't hold because you, what happens is that you wouldn't be able to knot everything because whenever you braid things around, you can just straighten the wires out. 
But with wires and connectors in, uh, uh, in electronic design, we don't care at the level of abstraction where we do the design. Maybe at the much lower level of abstraction we care when we actually print the circuit. But at the design level of abstraction, we don't care if the connectors wire around. And again, all these things have to play nicely with each other. So the parallel composition, the sequential composition, and the braiding have to play uh, nicely with each other. And you can see that from the equality of these two diagrams. Whether I put F on top of G and uh, I swap the right side, or G on top of F and I swap the left side, I should get back the same thing. This should be two diagrams that are equal. And the final component that we need in our language of combinators is a notion of feedback. <clears throat> so you have uh, a feedback on the left where you can take uh, something, a port that comes out on the left and connect it back to another port on the left or the same thing on the right. And it tells you, and the equation they satisfy that tells you that you have something that, uh, that works uh, pretty well is that if you, if you plug them in like that, you should be able to yank this S-shaped wire and get something that's essentially an identity. Okay? So, so what I described here is the language of combinators. And what is interesting about this language of combinator, which together form a mathematical structure called the compact closed category, is that there is a proved mathematical result coming from Kelly and La Plaza in, 19, uh, in the 1980s, where they showed that this is a language which is sound and complete for topological diagrams up to graph isomorphism. So any diagram, they proved that any diagram you can think of, which is a graph-like diagram expressed by boxes and wires, can be uh, expressed just with this handful of combinators. Uh, so, so, and moreover, equality of diagrams can be proved by reasoning with these equational laws that I just showed you. So this is an ideal language in which you can specify, uh, you can specify diagrams, and because it's a good language in which you can specify diagrams, it's a good language in which you can specify circuits. So going back to the same example, and changing the names a little bit so I don't have to use mathematical symbols, uh, you can introduce a syntax like that in which we can define the decision weight diagram. And this is a completely point-free style. Now, I don't have any names there. One is the identity. Fork is a forking wire. Two are two identities in parallel. And everything else are just uh, uh, circuits occurring there. So any diagram you can think of can be expressed in this point free style. And this in itself is not new. The Lava programming language that was, um, uh, it's a Haskell based structural design language developed by uh, Sharon and Satnam and other people had this idea of specifying hardware using a point free combinatorial style. But what's different here is that the choice of combinators is different. The choice of combinators that, um, that Satnam and, and his collaborator used in LAVA is, was actually turns out to be based on a different uh, struct, uh, way of describing diagram, which are called trace monoidal categories. But they didn't, they kind of reinvented them. They didn't apply this, uh, this structure. The way in which these combinators are in some sense better is that they bring out a functional structure that you can recover out of diagrams and that a functional structure that lives inside these diagrams all the time. So in category theory, this idea of function space is explained by the fact that a certain axiom always holds. So for any types, for any interfaces A and B, there is a circuit called eval, which corresponds to function application, so that for every circuit F, if I take the, there is a unique circuit H such that if I take the identity and I tensor it with H and I apply the evaluation, I get back F. So in, in other words, it says, I know I have functions if for every F there is a unique H so that if I apply H to the identity, I get back H. And that is what in a functional programming language you call currying. So if you have currying, 
you have functions. And this is expressed in a very abstract way. And indeed, in a compact closed category, using the combinators that I just showed you, this can be both the eval and the H can be expressed. And it is strikingly simple. If you want to curry the function F, all you need to do is you take the argument that you curry on, and using the feedback, the identity, and the parallel composition, you take it onto the right side. And the evaluation is just this one. It's basically connecting the argument to the, uh, to the right port of the function. And this is, in some sense, if you look at it now, it seems strikingly simple and borderline trivial. And the point is that functions really are just a bureaucracy of the interconnect. If you keep track of your ports and your wires in a certain way, then the functional structure is immediately apparent. So if you do it in the, in the relational style where everything is flat, then you get something like, like that on the top and the structure is not all that apparent. But if you, write your, uh, if you use the right combinators in the right way, then functions come out uh, fairly in, a, in a fairly straightforward way. And now we can already, just with this simple idea, we can do some synthesis because we are used to programming languages which are written like that on the top, but in fact, even programs that are, um, even programs that are uh, imperative can be written in a functional style. So I can write, for example, instead of writing v plus one, I can write add the reference of v and one, and so on. So here you have the usual syntax and a functionalized syntax. And from here to here is a straightforward syntactic transformation. Now, once we have a program written in this form, we know that we can, all we need to do is to have implementations for the various constant names that occur in the program. And then everything it gets, put to, gets put together just using function application and sometimes currying if we need to define functions. So let's look a little bit at some of the constants that uh, we can use. So for example, let's look at the simplest constants, the constant integer n and the command skip that doesn't do anything. Uh, to every type is going to correspond an interface. So for the type of commands, my interface has one, uh, it has one input and one output. The input says run the command, the output says I'm done executing the command. And because the skip is a command that doesn't do anything, its implementation is just going to be a wire that immediately, instantaneously propagates the input to the output. Um, for expression, the, the signature is going to be an input that says calculate the expression, and then an output that consists of a, a data line and a control line. The data line stores the value, and the control line tells you when you can read the value. Because this is a constant, again, inside you have just, uh, just a wire, and the value is connected to a fixed bit pattern. Something slightly more complicated, sequential composition. So if I want to sequence a command com and an expression exp and produce an expression with side effects, then my combinator, sequential combinator is going to be as follows. So here on the right, I have the expression port. See, it corresponds to this. On the left, I have the command, this one, and the expression, this one. So it works in the following way. I get an input here on the right. It's propagated and it says execute the command. When the command is finished, it comes, uh, an acknowledgement is going to come back in. Here I have a flip-flop where I wait for one cycle. I'm gonna to explain to you why I have to wait for one cycle. And then I propagate to the expression and I say run the expression. When the expression is calculated, then I report to the caller that the expression was calculated. And in this style, I can define all the constants that I need in my programming language. Where do they come from? They come from an interpretation of programming languages that is called game semantics. And that there is a, there is a very broad literature on game semantics that tells you how using game semantics you can produce 
very accurate, uh, these kind of interactive style models of pretty much any, uh, any constant, uh, any, any programming language feature you can think of. There are game semantics for state, for control, high order functions, recursive data types, and so on. They can all be mapped into that via uh, game semantics. There is an important technical consideration uh, when moving from game semantics, which is given usually an ace in an asynchronous style, to giving a synchronous representation. When you take an asynchronous process and you want to implement it synchronously, having also a latency which is as low as possible, you can run into problems. You can cause deadlocks if you put too many signals in the same clock cycles, but also, weirdly, you can resolve deadlocks, and both of these are problematic. Uh, and round abstraction is a technique that was uh, studied to, by me together with my student, Mohammed, uh, of doing that in a way that is compositionally correct, so that we can do it without breaking deadlocks and without introducing deadlocks. And that's why uh, sometimes you have to introduce these one clock delays, as I showed you on the uh, on this slide. This is an artifact of round abstraction which is required for correctness. And the main operation here is plugging things together. The main operation is function application. So if I want to apply function f to argument m, I synthesize the circuit for the argument, I synthesize the circuit for the function, and I just apply the evaluation. Here the caveat is that here on the left, these ports that go on the left of M and on the left of F, they correspond to the free identifiers occurring in F and M. And these free identifiers have to be disjoint for this interpretation to work, uh, which is a, of course, a constraint, which we're going to deal with it a little bit later. So here is an example what we can, uh, what we can implement uh, with, this with this compilation technique, which is kind of a, a realistic program, and it's an in-place map. Suppose that I have uh, a data structure residing somewhere in a, in a different circuit where I have an interface to it, and it gives me the following functions. An initializer for an iterator, a way to test whether I have more, uh, wh whether I have more elements in the data structure, a function that gives me a pointer to the current address in the data structure, a function that gives me the value of the current element in the data structure, and another function that moves the iterator to the next element in the data structure. And this is an in-place map because I initialize the iterator and then I apply f to the current value and I store it at the current location for as long as I have elements in my data structure. Uh, if we look at kind of the box style representation, the, 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 the abstract representation, well, these are going to be my, the constants that are involved in the description of this program, and these are the way they're interconnected. And now if I open, if I open the, the boxes and I look at the implementation that's inside the boxes and I, I, I tidy up the wires a little bit, then I get this circuit, and this circuit is a circuit for in-place map. So it is, it is a proof that you can synthesize code that is indeed higher order and it is, it, it, it is useful. The big limitation up to this point is the fact that we are not allowed to reuse identifiers in function application. And in fact, we are not allowed to reuse identifiers in any way. And if you want to write imperative programming, especially, then the name of an identifier is going to be used over and over again many times. So if you, if you want to do something as simple as an increment, see, I am applying assignment to store index and the addition of the dereferencing of store index, and it's already a problem because store index, this identifier, occurs twice in a function application. So, we have to look at ways to do sharing now because really sharing is the, the one aspect of functions which is dynamic and that allows uh, 
not only to, to access resources, but access resources efficiently without duplication. And one of the main weaknesses of, of, of hardware, uh, uh, of most of the tools for higher level synthesis that I have seen, is that the way they handle function is just by inlining. And inlining doesn't support any of, of the, this, uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't have any of the properties that I mentioned before. It does, you cannot do separate compilation using inlining. You cannot do heterogeneous compilation. You cannot access runtime services. But also, you end up duplicating your, your code every time you inline a function. So we need not to just inline, but also to share. And unlike functions, which come out naturally out of the mathematical structure of the diagram, uh, sharing has to be built in. And now what the mathematical formalism can give us, what the algebra, algebra can give us, what category theory can tell us, is when we implemented sharing correctly. And to implement sharing correctly, we have to realize a mathematical structure that's called product. And there are no way, known ways of getting from tensor, which is like product but without sharing, to proper product, which allows sharing. And there are certain axioms that have to be met. And these axioms are things that are, you actually have to implement your circuit in such a way that they hold. Otherwise, you don't have sharing uh, properly. The first one is the following. If I have a circuit of the following shape, it has a bunch of, it has a bunch of ports on the left and no ports on the right, then it should be uh, equivalent in behavior with any other circuit of this shape. So up to this point, uh, we made no distinction between things occurring on the left and ports occurring on the right. We said it's, it's just arbitrary. Now when we're talking about sharing, this is no longer arbitrary. One way of, of enforcing this property is saying that my circuits have to have an initialization property where the, first, where the very first signal to that circuit has to come from the right. So notice that if I have no ports on the right, and I require that the first signal has to come from the right, then all the circuits of this shape are going to be dead. And because they're dead, they're going to be equivalent. Another property is that of a projection. So if you have a product, you have to have a projection, a way of extracting things out of the product. And that tells us that for every signature A, we have to have a circuit called a diagonal that takes from an A to a pair of A. So this circuit realizes the sharing. And it behaves like a combination of a multiplexer and a demultiplexer, establishing a logical link between the shared, uh, a sort of, you can think of this as the kind of, the, 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 the circuit to be shared is plugged here, and the sharing is done from here. And the projection property says that if I'm only using one, of this, uh, <clears throat> these points where the sharing occurs, the, the other one is grounded, I'm not using it, then the resulting circuit should behave like an identity. So if I take this diagonal and I block one of the, uh, one of the components, what results has to behave like an identity. And that's pretty straightforward to implement by combining a multiplexer and a demultiplexer and one bit of state. The final property that we have to uh, we have to make sure that is respected is one of, again, a naturality property which corresponds to inlining, which tells you that a function that's shared should behave exactly as if it was inlined. So here I have a, I have a circuit F, and the right side is shared from two places through a delta, and this should be the same behaviorally as taking two copies of F and then sharing their free identifiers. And from the point of view of, 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 of the behavior of hardware, this corresponds to self-resetting circuits. So with a, a self-resetting circuit works in a transaction-like way, like way. So you, you start 
a transaction with a self-resetting circuit, and then when you're done, the circuit has to be automatically returned uh, to its initial state. So things that, uh, for example, things that you cannot share because through, by construction don't satisfy this property are things such as counters. So it doesn't make any sense to share a counter because one copy of a counter will receive all the inputs, but if I take two copies of a counter, each one is going to receive roughly half the inputs. And the behavior uh, is going to be different. Right? So you know that some circuits cannot be shared and some can be shared. Uh, and this is kind of a global requirement for all your circuits. So what we can define is a very simple access protocol that allows, uh, that defines circuits that can be shared. And uh, this access protocol has two rules. Initialization, each circuit must have a designated initial input, and that initial input should always occur on the right. And reset, each circuit must have a designated final output, which corresponds in some sense logically to the initial input, which returns the circuit, the circuit to the original state. And so it happens, all the constants that we have, all the implementations of the, all the constants that we need in the programming language, satisfy these two properties. Moreover, uh, what's interesting about this uh, a simple access protocol like this is that it's compositional. So if I take circuits, individual circuits that satisfy this protocol and I plug them together in a legal way, I'm going to get bigger circuits that automatically satisfy this protocol as well. So that greatly reduces the burden of proof and is very important for a compiler. You can only check the basic sort of the basic circuits that you are going to use to make sure that these, pro these uh, properties are satisfied and then automatically through compositions they are going to be preserved. So we can now implement sharing and we are going to implement sharing for technical reasons in product formation rather than in function application. So I can, when I take the product of two circuits I can automatically share all the free identifiers like that. So now I can write imperative programs such as f of x semicolon f of x and that can be written in a functional like notation as make, creating the tuple of f of x and f of x and applying the sequential composition operator. So here is, uh, here is the circuit. Here you can see the diagonal for the function type, the diagonal from the, for the result type, and here is the semicolon, sequential composition, and they sit in a box. And here, outside of the box, you can plug in one instance of f and one instance of x only. So you don't have to duplicate f and x twice. Okay, now very briefly, just to mention some more advanced issues to get to a more, uh, even more realistic programming language one of them is that we still do not allow sharing in function application. So we do not allow f of f of x because, well, in here is you can trace kind of uh, uh, the flow of a token through two diagonals if you try to construct f of f of x and you end up with an infinite loop. So that is not correct. So whenever you have nested function application like this, programs have to be rewritten in a systematic way. But fortunately, very many programs that uh, do use nested application can be rewritten in a way where everything that's nested is actually duplicated. So the things that we really cannot share, we can duplicate. And the most, uh, probably the most typical example where nested application comes out is in recursion. So how do you compile recursion? So we can also compile recursion uh, in the following way. Whenever you, can, you compile a circuit F, you think of it as being parameterized by a constant. And uh, that constant in some sense reflects the depth, conceptually the depth of the recursion stack. But there is no recursion stack. It's all the memory is distributed throughout the circuit. 
And your nested fun function call is going to be something like that. The first function calls the second one, the third one, and so on. And you can take a structure like this and fold it onto itself. And here, instead of having a constant parameter, you can have a, uh, you can have a counter. And the fixed point combinator, whenever you have a recursive call, you just increment the counter. Whenever you make a recursive return, you decrement the counter. And in this way, you can also implement recursion. So you, have, you end up with uh, a pretty mature way of dealing with functions. We, have, we can have separate compilation. We can have automatic sharing and management of resources and recursion. Uh, and that pretty much uh, covers everything that we can do up to this point. And I'm just, I'm just going to, uh, to conclude with, uh, again, some kind of, a, some kind of an, uh, a bit of an, a very brief opinion piece, which everything that we are doing in this, uh, in this research program, the geometry of synthesis program, is not as much quantitative as qualitative. It's not about making our programs 10 times faster or using 10 times less resources. But we are trying to, to, to do higher level synthesis in such a way that we give the programmer a better experience and hopefully allowing the programmer to be more productive, even though uh, that productivity might involve um, a, loss of, uh, a, a loss of performance. Now, the key here in making this, uh, in making this, this succeed is probably finding the right balance between how much, uh, uh, how much flexibility and how much, uh, how much of a better experience you give to the programmer and how much, you improve, uh, how much you improve the experience of programming and the productivity versus uh, how much performance you lose. And so far, we have a, we have an, uh, a, a prototype compiler, and, and we did some experiments with it, but it's largely a work in progress. But the initial, the initial results that uh, we have are, are promising, and we hope that we are striking the right balance. And this is a list of the uh, relevant references that cover this tutorial. There is also a tutorial in the proceedings that corresponds to this talk. Thank you very much.